One day, Surendranath Mitra confided his worries and anxieties to his friends and neighbors, Ramchandra Datta and Manmohan Mitra. He also narrated an incident. One day after noon meal, he was standing in his parlor when a dark-complexioned Bhairavi, a nun of the Tantric sect, wearing ochre-colored clothes, with unbound hair and a trident in her hand, walked past the house. Looking at Surendranath, she remarked, Oh my child, everything else is void, that alone is true. Though he could not make out its significance, this made him think deeply. The two friends gave a sympathetic hearing to Surendranath, but could hardly make out the cause of his worries, nor could they find any solution. But remembering the efficacy of the holy company of Sri Ramakrishna, who had proved to be a great help to them, Ramchandra suggested, there leaves a Paramhamsa at Dakshineshwar. Why don't you visit him, please? Manmohan not only supported Ramchandra's views, but to convince Surendranath, narrated his personal experiences with the Paramhamsa. Surendranath, who had received an English education and held an important post in a British firm in Calcutta, laughed at this suggestion. You hold the Paramhamsa in high esteem. Well and good, he retorted, but why do you want me to visit him? His friends were not dismayed. Anxious as they were about Surendranath, they would not leave the matter there. They continued to persuade him. He finally gave way with the remark, I will be like a crane among swans. I have seen enough of quarks. I may see him. But, mind you, if he talks nonsense, I shall twist his ears. So confident were they about Sri Ramakrishna that they accepted their friend's challenge. Like many other educated young men of the time, Surendranath boasted of his atheism and led an unorthodox life. He was addicted to drinking. He cherished an exaggerated notion about man's free will. Then about 30 years old, Surendranath was fair looking and strongly built. He had a reputation for charity. Though somewhat harsh in his dealings with others, he was simple, straightforward, and outspoken. One day, very likely not later than the middle of 1880, Surendranath started for Dakshineshwar in the company of Ramchandra and Manmohan. Entering Sri Ramakrishna's room, they found him seated on a couch and a few devotees sitting on the floor. Surendranath, on hearing from his friends, had formed an idea about the Paramhamsa which was quite different from the one he had after meeting him. Nonetheless, it is true that Sri Ramakrishna's appearance could hardly impress him. At first Surendranath, like many others, found nothing extraordinary about him. He did not salute Sri Ramakrishna, nor did he care to greet him even. Quietly he seated himself in one corner of the room while Ramchandra and Manmohan prostrated themselves before the master and took their seats. As was his wont, Sri Ramakrishna was, however, the first to greet the visitors with folded palms. The deep probe of Sri Ramakrishna's spiritual insight revealed at the very first glance who the newcomer was. He recognized Surendranath as one of those few commissioned by the Divine Mother to defray a great part of his expenses. He must have recollected one of his visions, which he narrated in a subsequent meeting. Sri Ramakrishna, addressing Surendranath, said, you have both yoga and bhoga. The devotee of the Divine Mother attains dharma and moksha. He enjoys artha and kama as well. 
once I saw you in a vision as the child of the Divine Mother. You have both yoga and bhoga, otherwise your countenance would look dry. Surendranath, with a casual look, was trying to size up the Paramhamsa, but before he could form a definite idea, his attention was drawn to the melodious voice of Sri Ramakrishna. Apparently paying no attention to the newcomer, Sri Ramakrishna continued his discourse. He said, Well, why does a man choose the role of a young monkey rather than that of a kitten? The young monkey, with great exertion, somehow clings to its mother while the latter jumps from one place to another. But the kitten's nature is different. The kitten of itself cannot cling to its mother. It lies on the ground and cries, Mayav, Mayav. It leaves everything to its mother. The mother cat sometimes puts it on a bed, sometimes on the roof, sometimes behind a pile of wood. She carries the kitten in her mouth hither and thither. The young monkey sometimes misses its grip, falls on the ground and gets hurt. But the kitten has no such fear, for its mother carries it safely. Here lies the difference between self-effort and reliance on God. The words of Sri Ramakrishna struck Surendranath. It seemed that they were meant for him. He began to ponder, that is it. I too am behaving like the young monkey. Self-willed as I am, I try to get things done through my personal efforts, and the result is I suffer terribly. Why do I not try to surrender myself to God like the kitten which depends entirely on its mother? The words of the Paramhamsa were enchanting. Surendranath had never heard the like before. Like one starving, he sat down with avidity to the spiritual feast that Sri Ramakrishna spread before him. After a short pause, Sri Ramakrishna continued. When the mother takes hold of the hand of her son, there is no fear of a fall. A young boy and his father walk along a slippery ridge on a rainy day. Now, if the boy holds his father, he may fail, but if the father holds the boy in his grip, there is no fear of a fall. Similarly, if someone relies on the mother and depends entirely on her, he will have nothing to fear, he will have no problem at all. Surendranath heaved a sigh of relief. The burden of the anxieties which had seized his mind vanished like a cloud blown away by the wind. He resolved, why not? I too shall depend entirely on the mother and occasionally call, Ma, Ma, the rest will be looked after by her. After a long discourse, Sri Ramakrishna asked Ramlal, his nephew, to distribute the prasadha or consecrated food of the mother Kali to all present. It was time to leave. Surendranath was by this time a changed man. He saluted Sri Ramakrishna touching the ground with his head, and then the latter gave his finishing touch. In a sweet, endearing tone, Sri Ramakrishna told him, Come again, won't you? He could never have forgotten Ramakrishna, however much he might have tried. He was in fact caught in the love net of the adept fisherman that Sri Ramakrishna was. On the return journey, Surendranath confessed jokingly, Ah, how he turned the tables on me. I came to twist his ears, now I find my own ears twisted. Pleased at the happy turn of events, his friends roared with laughter at this witty remark. Well, how could I guess that he was such a great man, mused Surendranath. How could I know that he could read others' minds? In reply, Manmohan and Ramchandra narrated similar experiences of their own.
Surendranath confided to his friends that he had in fact been contemplating suicide, so disgusted had he become with worldly life. A victim of mental depression, he suffered terribly at times. However, soon after this first meeting, he was changed noticeably. Even his marked unorthodox habits, including the strong addiction to alcohol, were gradually overcome. His warm, generous nature easily turned towards spiritual devotion. He used to cry mournfully for the Divine Mother, like a child, and wanted to talk of her only. He would often become absorbed in deep meditation on the Mother. Surendranath was the first to get prepared an oil painting depicting the Master's message of religious harmony. In the picture, Sri Ramakrishna was pointing out to Keshab Chandrasin that followers of different religions proceed to the same goal by different paths. Sri Ramakrishna expressed his appreciation of the picture. He said, yes, it contains everything. This is the ideal of modern times.